morning, please take your Bibles and turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Hold your finger there in that spot. We're going to read the first 17 verses. And he talks about Paul was addressing the church, an amazing church that was growing and thriving in Christ. He praised them for their uh, upholding of strength in the persecution. He praised them for their love for one another. That is something that needs to be a characteristic of every born-again believer in Christ. And then here we find ourselves where he's going to talk a little bit about the day of the Lord and the man of lawlessness, and then how to stand firm. So the day of the Lord covers the 17 verses in chapter 2, and he's going to talk about in the first 12 verses, the man of lawlessness, and then chapter 2, 13 through 17, he talks about standing firm in the midst of opposition and persecution, standing firm in pandemics, amen? Standing firm as the body of Christ, it's just so critically important. Human history has had its share of evil leaders. So download a moment, a little grocery list here. I'll say some names and it'll remind you Adolf Hitler, Joseph Stalin, Pol Pot, responsible for killing over two million people. Two million people. Heinrich Himmler in the early 1900s to 1945. Here's a name, Saddam Hussein. Through 1953 to 2003, Idi Amin. Now we're really going to take you back. Ivan the Terrible. How about Nero in Paul's day? Or Domitian the Paranoid was in John's later years. The reason I've said that, to kind of set our thought this morning, is because one is coming that Jesus told us about that will surpass all of them. Of all the evil leaders that you've ever read about in the history of the world, one is coming that will make them look like Shirley Temple. And Paul talks about it. The man of lawlessness. He will be the most fiendish, wicked, powerful man to ever walk the earth. And by the way, the Bible describes him by many names. Gog of the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshech and Tubal, Ezekiel 38, verse 2, the little horn of Daniel, chapter 7, verse 8, the prince who is to come, Daniel, chapter 9, the king who does as he pleases, Daniel, chapter 11, thank you, the foolish, worthless, Shepherd, Zechariah chapter 11, 15 through 17. And the best known name described to him in Revelations 11, the beast. And you hear a lot of talk about that. Well, Paul is addressing that in the Thessalonian church because he's a shepherd. And he's hearing the concerns that they have. A lot of them thought they missed the rapture. And so they were concerned about that, which would have been bad for Paul, right? So Paul, the shepherd, he's actually talking to them in the love of his heart and the love of Christ, trying to calm them. So let me say to you, you haven't missed the rapture. Hercules, Hercules, Hercules. If we miss the rapture, we're in a lot of trouble, y'all. Okay? But you haven't. So the lawless one, all of those names that I just gave you, here we are in chapter 2 of Thessalonians and Paul describes this guy as the man of lawlessness. Let's go to the text and let's read this morning. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being together, gathered together to Him, we ask you, brothers, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed, either by a spirit or a spoken word or a letter seeming to be from us, to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Let no one deceive you in any way. That's a powerful verse in verse 3 to thus today. Don't let anyone 
deceive you in any way. For that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction. Look at verse 4. Who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, that's in Israel, proclaiming himself to be God, which is after the three and a half years of promising false peace, etc., etc., in all that's taking place in the land of Israel, he stands up and says, I am God and you will worship me. So look at verse 5. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I already told you these things? He's referring back to the letter in 1 Thessalonians. And you know what is restraining him now so that he may be revealed in his time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains it will do so until he is out of the way. He's referring to the Holy Spirit of God that restrains and controls all evil on the earth. And then the lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth and, and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming. Verse 9. The coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan which all power and false signs and wonders, and with all wicked deception for those who are perishing because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. Verse 11, Therefore, God sends them a strong delusion so that they may believe what is false in order that all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Now think about that. He sends them a strong delusion. Why don't people believe the Bible? Why don't people believe like Christians believe? Why don't they see what they should see that's happening? Because there's a delusion that God allows to be upon people. Only the elect and the righteous are able to comprehend the truth of God. They're not going to get it. Remember, Paul told the Corinthians, the reason they cannot comprehend spiritual things is they don't have the Spirit of God in them. You understand that? There's a lot of people today in a post-Christian culture that just will not and do not or refuse to understand that. So it's not up to me. It's not up to you to convince them. It's up to you and I to be faithful witnesses to share the message of God. That's the gospel that Christ died for. So verse 13, let's finish that little passage in, in, in 2 Thessalonians but we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers beloved by the Lord, because this is powerful. God chose you as the first fruits to be saved through sanctification. You should say amen. You didn't earn salvation. You weren't given salvation by the extent that it was all about you. If you are the elect of God, right? And that's what he says, 13b, God chose you as the first fruits to be saved through sanctification, that is the setting apart for a holy work of God, by the Spirit and the belief in the truth. To this He called you through our gospel, so that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brothers, stand firm and hold to the traditions that you were taught by us, either by our spoken word or by our letter. Look at verse 16 and 17. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work in every word. May God bless the reading of his word. Amen. I hope that you are encouraged by God's word. Because to be honest with you, what else you got? Outside of the Bible, what else are you going to turn to? What else are you going to read? What else are you going to memorize? When you need truth today, we go to the Bible to establish true north. It's a true, true statement of what God says to us. And you have the words of God that he's speaking. It doesn't matter about dead theologians or alive theologians. If they all point you back, 
to the great theologian, that's Jesus Christ. Amen? You have everything that you need to be faithful and successful in life with God. You are equipped by the one who loves you. And that verse tells you that, that God chose you as the first fruits to be saved through sanctification by His Spirit. Now I want to talk a little bit about the lawless one. You know he's best known as uh, the, uh, the Antichrist. Anybody ever heard of the Antichrist? Okay, you have. I mean, unless you're a believer at all and you haven't looked at the end of the book, you know, or you know the end of the movie, that, that's, that's going to happen. Guys, God has to bring this to fruition. There's some generation that's going to be alive that this all unfolds. And it could be us. It really could. Now, I'm not a doomsday guy, but I, did you know that there was a doomsday clock? Now, I see people already starting to Google it. <clears throat> but through the years, I, I mentioned it briefly, they would, I guess this board of, I don't know, worldly people decided that they would take a look at all the events of the world and then they would set a time. Midnight means that the end of the world, the end of the rule of man's over. And so the closest we've ever been has usually been about one minute till midnight. There was a year, 1940s, that was two minutes for midnight. Well, they just came out with a recent report I think it was in January, no, hold me to that, but said that we are 100 seconds away from midnight. Now, they don't know, okay? Just so you know, only God knows the future, okay? But I just thought it was interesting that they actually have something like that, that you can, I guess people watch it. I don't know, but I could find other better things to do than to sit there and look at that clock to see where we are. And one of that is sharing the message that Jesus Christ saves souls. That is the work of every born-again believer in Jesus Christ. That is the gospel message of which you and I have been called to share, to be ready in season and out. It's, 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 we've, we've been, what's the word, deflected away from where we're called to be serving. And I, I don't ever want to do that. You know, I mean, it, it would probably be very intimidating if we actually gave a testimony each Sunday and said, if you shared the gospel of Jesus Christ last week, stand up. Don't. If you shared the gospel of Jesus Christ in the last month, stand up. Don't. But I'm just saying, what good is it if we keep hearing the encouraging word of God, and we're thankful that He saved our souls from hell, and we don't share that good news with our neighbors and our friends and people in the workplace. You do know that's the best news ever to the world. It is. The best news that you'll ever receive is that you have received Christ through the gospel message that you have eternal life with him. Is that not the single greatest message? I've heard a lot of good news. Congratulations, Mr. Maynard, you have a baby boy. Congratulations, Mr. Maynard, you have a baby girl. Congratulations, you have a third baby boy, third child, second boy. I've had a lot of good news. Congratulations, you got the raise. Congratulations, you got the promotion. Congratulations, you got married. Right? Somebody actually loves you. Right? Come on now. Come on, you married people. Encourage these young folks that marriage is the bomb. Let them know. You, 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 if you stayed silent, good luck at lunch. You should be excited about those things because we know that life is fleeting. And through my years of ministry, some wonderful men and women of Christ have left their spouses to go be with the Lord. That is incredibly difficult. It really is. We have been given salvation through Christ. But I want to talk about the Antichrist. By the way, the anti Antichristos is a compound Greek word. It's made up of the preposition 
of anti and the noun Christos. Anti can mean both against and in place of. Both meanings are appropriate here in this chapter. Anyone who opposes Jesus Christ, the Son of God, His person, His work, listen, manifests the spirit of the Antichrist. The only way that you can say Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior is because of the power of the cross, the work of Jesus, and the indwelling Holy Spirit of God. That's it. To be able to say, I am a born-again believer in Jesus Christ. My debt has been paid in full by the Son of God, the Holy One of Israel, the Redeemer, the Reconciler. He is the one that the only one that could have paid for your sins and mine. Now think about that. Right now you're thinking, I sure hope he doesn't go into sin. I sure hope the preacher doesn't talk about sin today. I'm, I'm having a good day. Today is communion, right? We're going to have fellowship together. Man, I hope you don't talk about sin. You know, the Bible has a lot to say about that. But I'm going to give you a break today. I want to talk about the father of sin, the, the original, the antichrist. And, and, and so people that oppose Christ, the Son of God, his person or his work manifest the antichrist spirit. This is the antichrist, wrote John, the one who denies the father and the son. 1 John 2, 22. For that reason, John could write that many antichrists have appeared. Many antichrists are appearing. You're seeing that increase. Folks, you're not seeing that decrease. But the final Antichrist will be the culmination of all the Antichrists who have ever gone before him. 1 John 2, verse 18. He will be the ultimate manifestation of the Antichrist spirit. The spirit of the Antichrist has been at work ever since the fall of humanity in the Garden of Eden. And God made some promises about that that you ought to be happy about today. God's promise was made in Genesis of a man who would bruise the head of Satan and redeem humanity from sin and death. Genesis 3, 14 and 15. So since the fall, Satan has opposed God's plan of redemption and attempted to thwart the work of the Redeemer in you and in me. In the world, he is throwing everything in the kitchen sink at Christians. I mean, you've watched recently the events of Afghanistan and Kabul, the airport, and we have brothers and sisters there. You talk about persecution, that's persecution. That if you had the U Bible on your phone, we'll kill you. If you helped the Americans anyway, we'll kill you. We have missionaries on the ground that they know by associating with Jesus Christ, their life on earth is over. I heard a preacher talking this past week, and he said, really, in the eyes of God, we're all dead men preaching to dead men. In the beauty of Jesus Christ and the gospel message, the day you and I were born, guys, the clock has been ticking on us. And so while you have time on this earth, what are you going after? What are you chasing? What, are you, what, are you, what is the goal and the purpose? Is it just to collect a bunch of things that we're not taking anyway? We're going to leave to other people? Men have built companies, and they've, they've made their money, and they've done all these amazing things. But isn't it interesting to know that you came into the world with nothing, and you're going out with nothing? And everything you work so hard to save and value, to pass on the kids, you don't know whether they're going to squander that or not. You're going to feel good because you left it to them. You have no idea after you're gone what's going to happen. So Genesis 6 covers the increasing evil of man and God's destruction of evil flesh in the flood. God drowned the entire world, sparing only Noah and his seven members hoping to destroy the lines of the messianic promise. Some years later, Satan incited the Egyptians to murder all the male Hebrew babies. That's Exodus 1. And then 600 years later, the family of the Messiah was reduced to a single family with a single child. 
And the devil's plans failed here as well. And even through the course of history, when you look at the Bible, when Haman attempted to extinguish the Jews, some 400 years had passed and elapsed. God saved them through Esther and Mordecai. Those are just a few of the highlights of Satan's relentless attempts to hinder the redeeming work of the Messiah. And I believe this with all my heart. There are people that God designed in your life that you will share the gospel message with, that you will witness about your testimony, how God saved you, and that you may be able to lead to Christ. We must be praying and looking for those people to influence. I've always said this through the years, we cannot be people that take their can of beanie weenies, run to a cave with a glow stick, and wait until Jesus returns. That's not the biblical view, guys. It is accounted to you a stewardship. You have been entrusted with a holy stewardship. That is the gospel message that God gave you, that through that message of the person that led you to the Lord, you may share the message and that they may come to know the Lord. If they're of the elect, only God knows. But the mandate is given. The commandment is given. Go into all the world and make disciples. Go into all the world. Hmm. And after the Messiah, his birth, when Jesus was born of a virgin, Satan having failed to destroy and eliminate him, do you remember Herod's barbarous acts to kill the Lord by murdering all the male children two years and younger? Are you kidding me? Can you imagine? Can you imagine? Christian Abbey's about to give birth. Can you imagine an edict coming from the president to say you're going to murder all of them because of some messianic... I can't, I can't even fathom that. But he did. There was weeping like never heard before. When Mary and Joseph escaped to Egypt, even when Christ was walking amongst the Jewish people, Satan incited a crowd, and I've been on that hill, to try and throw Jesus off a cliff. Luke 4, 28. Throughout history, Satan's hatred has extended through the Holocaust, even in Germany. It extends his hatred to you. Listen, you cannot serve two masters, for you will like one and hate the other, or vice versa. But if you are born again, and you are sold out for Jesus Christ, and he is your master and Lord, then that's where we rise and fall. Amen? So here in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul wrote this section to deal with the Thessalonians' loss of hope. Maybe some of you have lost hope. But as believers, our hope is never in the government. Our hope is never in anyone else, in leaders or military power. Our hope is in Jesus Christ. Amen? Is that your hope? And so why does he go to great lengths to tell us to keep our eyes fixed on the Lord Jesus Christ? Keep your eyes fixed on the eternal one. Keep your, because it's so easy to pull you away. And there are a million things to pull your eyes off of Jesus. Now, I don't know whether we're 100 seconds away from midnight, but I think it's important that we do what God put us on the earth to do. Amen? Just a brief moment. It's a sobering and thought-provoking time for me to read and compare the epitaphs of tombs under Rome from the early centuries. The catacombs, they, they call them. They say volumes about the value of our faith and our hope in Christ. And we can learn as much about that from the tombs of the unbelievers as we do from the tombs of believers. It's not hard to distinguish as to whether an epitaph belongs to to a believer or an unbeliever. Let me give you an example. Here's one. Live for the present hour, since there is nothing else. 
And I lift up my hands against the gods, little g, who took me away at the age of 20, though I had done no harm, end quote. Or how about this one? Traveler, curse me not as you pass, for I am in darkness and cannot answer. Do you think those were Christian authors? No. No. Contrast these with the following epitaphs found in the tombs of Christian families. Here lies Marcia, put to rest in a dream of peace, and Lawrence to his sweet son, born away of angels. At the beginning, as pagans were being delivered from the curse of unbelief by the grace of God and the power of the gospel message, these new Christians needed to be taught about the eternal hope that we have in Jesus Christ. Hope ought to thrive in you, believer. Hope ought to thrive in you, believer. They need to see the hope of Jesus Christ in every one of us. The world is crying out for a better way. What else do you have? We have the answer. Jesus is the antidote. Why is he the last thing we ever want to talk about? He should be the first thing that we want to talk about. Hey, I don't know about any of that stuff. We talked about it in Sunday school this morning. Your testimony is a powerful witnessing tool. They cannot take away what Jesus has done for you and for me. So the text, looking back, 1 Thessalonians addressed the issue. He said, Paul said in the first letter, we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, so there's a lot of uninformed brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve, as do the rest who have no hope. Paul's talking to the church again. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ shall not precede those who have fallen asleep. Then he goes on to explain why. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. Ooh, let it be today. Come on now. Can you imagine? I've never heard an archangel shout. I've never heard the blast of a trumpet. I've heard Nick play the trumpet. But I've never heard archangels play trumpets that everyone's going to hear, and all eyes will be fixed in the east. Everyone will see the coming of the Son of Man. Don't you ever have them days or weeks where you say, man, I wish you'd come back today, Jesus. But I'm thankful that God didn't answer a single one of those Christians who said that before I got saved. I'd be in trouble. So I thank God for unanswered prayers sometimes. Because I wouldn't be saved. If God answered all the prayers of the people before I became born again at the age of 25, man, I would be in a mess of trouble right now. But God knows. God's in control. You can rest assured that he's got it. It's all worked out, folks. He's got a plan. Oh, by the way, he's sticking to it. So pray. Tell him everything. Talk to him about everything. Get your heart out to him. He knows, but he loves the fellowship. There's a concept, right? Christians fellowshipping with God. We're going to have a potluck fellowship after here as soon as I get done from Babylon. But I want you to think about those things today. The point of the passage is that those who have died in the faith of Christ are not at a disadvantage at all when Jesus comes back. They've not lost their reward in death. The man or the woman of faith needs not look at death as does the unbelieving world around us. Listen to another epitaph of an unbeliever. Read simply, it says, I was not, I became. I am not, I care not. Is that not the way of the world? The world doesn't care. If the grave ends it all, they think, ah, he who has the most toys wins. But God is saying, there's so much more, child. I got so much more for you. You have no idea. Girl, you think you can design a house and a mansion? You have no idea. I'm building a place for you that it'll take you 10,000 years before you get to the foyer. You're going to marvel over at my doorknobs before you even get in. 
believers, you know what God has in store for those that love him? I mean, look, I don't like what's happening around the globe, but I can't fix it. But I can pray about it. And I want to pray for my brothers and sisters because if it's ever me one day, I sure hope that there's some people around the world praying for me in a little church. Amen? God needs your prayers, and so do our brothers and sisters. Paul refers to the dead as being asleep, which is intended to show the temporary nature of death. I'm not going to go there, but 1 Corinthians 15, 6, John 11, 11 through 15 discusses all that. We serve not the God of the dead. We serve the God of the living. Our God is not dead. Our tomb is empty because he arose on the third day. He ascended through the realm of the prince of the power of the air to sit at the right hand of God Almighty. Do you know why he's sitting there? Because God said, sit here, son, while I make all your enemies something to just prop your feet up, a footstool. You don't want to be an enemy of God. You don't. Even though it looks like evil is winning, it's not. And every one of those that are producing evil right now, I was in Israel one time and I saw a t-shirt of all the armies that ever came against Israel. And he named all the armies and he said, defeated, defeated, defeated. The point was, Everybody that rose up against the Jews, oh, God used them to discipline them, but they no longer exist. They're gone. So although it looks that way, and you think, oh my gosh, what are we going to do? You know, it looks like evil is winning, and, and we, need, we need more beanie weenies and glow sticks, because it really looks bad in America. No, God's just given us a taste of what the world has been going through. And we need to have compassion and love for those brothers and sisters that are going through that. We are assured by the resurrection of Christ that we serve not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. Matthew twenty-two thirty-two. 32, Paul does not forbid grief, but only a certain kind of grief, a hopeless, despairing grief. We grieve when a loved one goes home, but listen, it's a temporary grief because if they have a relationship with Christ, then you know where they are and you absolutely will see them again. That's hope. But to the unbelieving world, they have no hope. They have no hope. And if they think it's bad now, wait the first nanosecond of those that don't know Jesus Christ. Because we've always said that, that here on earth, we Christians, this is the only evil that we're really going to experience, the only hell. But those that don't believe, this is the only heaven that they're going to see. It might be bad here, but I'm going to tell you something. I learned feeding on the streets of Lakeland, the devil's got more loaves than you can ever imagine. He can get low. So we are assured by the resurrection of Christ, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, 1 Thessalonians, Thessalonians 4.14, and in that passage it needs to be pointed out that this passage only deals with the death and the resurrection of the righteous. Paul does not concern himself at all with the destiny of the unbeliever here, though other passages do, Acts 24, 15, John 5, 28, Daniel 12, 2. But here Paul wasn't concerning himself with anyone else but the elect. And in the house of God, I'm talking to the elect of God, that we understand what was taking place in this passage to the Thessalonians. Jesus' resurrection affirms that there is such a thing as life after death. When you're born, you become a living soul. The Spirit of God connects with the Spirit, and then our soul that makes up our mind, our intellect, our emotions. All of that ties together being influenced by the indwelling Holy Spirit of God. It's an eternal work that happens on the inside that affects the spirit and the soul and the body. Where externally it's totally different. If you don't have Christ in you, the influence of the world around you is going to affect you and affect your soul and affect your inner spirit. Why do we need to be born again? Because we need the indwelling Holy Spirit of God who will teach us and mold us and shape us and tell us. He's our smoke detector when evil is around and things go off. You know how it is when like, you miss a turn on the interstate and you always end up in the worst part of town? Am I the only one that does that? 
Man, oh man, it's Shevitz. I don't know how it happens, but I'll take a wrong turn. I'm like, oh, this ain't good. One time Noah and I were in Pittsburgh, and we were going to the baseball game, the pirate game. And once you get off the bridge and you go down into Hades, I mean downtown Pittsburgh, the phone signal was gone. The GPS went off. And by the way, they were on a garbage strike. I thought we were in a, a scene from Mad Max. And I'm trying to be cool in front of my son. I'm like, oh, this ain't good. This ain't good at all. This ain't good at all. I mean, you know, when you were driving by and, and the larger women were talking trash to you, I was like, oh, this ain't good. And I'm trying to get up. I just want to go to a pirate ball game. That's all we wanted to do. And I remember, he pro- I don't know if he even remembers any of that. You know, but I mean, I'm telling you, it, it just looked bad. I mean, the garbage was stacked six feet in the air. I got no GPS. I'm like, man, we just missed Kansas, Dorothy. And I don't know how we got back. I just remember, this is how I did it. I remember praying and then looking for bridges. And I'm like, I'm going up on a bridge. I'm going up on a bridge. I'm going up on a bridge. Just to get up on a bridge. Because when you're up on a bridge, you can see a little bit better. I don't even know how I know we got there. But we did. We made it to the ball game. But I'm just saying, isn't it amazing sometimes how we find ourselves in situations that just aren't good. And what do you do with that? Well, as a believer, you trust your Lord. That whether we're going through death of a loved one, or whether an economy is taking a hit, or whether you're, we worry about things that God said don't worry about. And the shepherd Paul is just loving on his flock. And he's just trying to say, guys, relax. Don't let any doctrine out there on the internet or anywhere else sway you from the truth of this book. God is in control. Don't worry about those things. Get your eyes back on Jesus. We are assured that we will rise to meet him again, for the Lord himself will descend. I mean, it's either going to be the rapture, right? Or whatever it is that you, your theory is that you believe, you know, or we'll go through some of it. Some think you'll go through all of it. Some think you won't go through any of it. But even that doesn't matter, because God has it all in control. Do you believe that? Are you confident of that today, that no matter what you're facing, what you're going through, that God has you covered? The more you depend on him, the more he's going to respond to you. You know me, I've always said this, you can have as much or as little as Jesus as you want. How much of Jesus do you want, girl? How much of Jesus do you want, sir? Is you can have pressed down, shaken, and overflowing. That's where we all ought to go for. He's just reminding them that they're taken care of. They didn't miss the rapture. I don't know about you. Are you guys afraid of flying? If you're afraid of flying, and I know people who are afraid of flying, if you don't want to raise your hand, that's okay. But you won't be afraid of the rapture. You're not going to get, I mean, I don't know how fast the twinkling of an eye is, but I hear it's pretty fast. Like, did you, they, they actually measured a blink. They can tell you how fast. I've looked it up, and they tell you how fast a blink is. But in the twinkling of an eye, a sparkle, a blink, you're here, you're gone. You're here, you're in heaven. You're here, you're with Christ. All right, at the same time, everybody blink. That's amazing. That fast. I mean, I got to drive Nick Harper's Hemi Torque Dodge Ram for a week. And I got zero to 60 in 3.2. I'm just saying, I, I, I thought to myself, self, you're on a straight strip of road here on 27, right past the last Winter Haven exit, and you know where that is before you get to Crump Road. You know, yeah, I had that urge, and I did. And I thought, oh, this is so good. Sorry, I was confessing in church. So what's said at church stays at church, right? He don't need to know that. But it made me think about how fast 
when the rapture happens, I'm going to be with my Jesus. I ain't worried about a thing. God's in control. God's got a plan. God's covered you. He's assuming every responsibility for you, everything that you are, would ever dream to be. Listen, at salvation, God took that on through his son, Jesus Christ. We were sought and bought, and, and, and we owe him everything. So even that phrase caught up, and I'm not going to go into it. I had a whole big thing uh, from a doctor about the rapture and how it was in the Bible, and people would make those arguments. But what does the return of Christ mean to you, the believer? What does the return of Christ mean to you, the believer? I believe it should generate an exhilarating hope and confidence because we know the end of the story and we know who wins. It should also produce a great longing to be found faithful when Christ returns and a great passion for the mission because we understand the consequences of those of our neighbors and our people at work that are around us that don't know Jesus. Guys, we have been called saved and set apart that sanctification is a process that takes the rest of your life but you have been set apart for a work do you agree with that and if we'll just get busy and just say lord how can you use me this week i, I want to be a faithful witness to you we, i say we should we should have people on a list and i got people that i'm praying for that i just get an audience with and then I have people that I'm praying for that I get to share the message of Christ with. It shouldn't always be about our jobs, our money, our vacations, our fun, our pleasure. That's what the world's going after, right? Our fun, our pleasure, our wealth is stored up in heaven where moth and rust will not corrupt. And one day, we'll have plenty of time to explore all the blessings of our faithfulness here on earth but we must be faithful here on earth. Look for that lady. Look for that man. Look for that family. That's what Paul was as, as a shepherd. He has such a loving heart. He was a deep theologian, but he has such a heart that he took the time and God allowed him, which says a lot about our God, to help you understand what's coming and how to be proactive in it. And God has got a great future for Thrive Church. I'm just telling you, but this is where we'll blow it. I don't want to blow it. But if we don't return to the mission, the Great Commission, and that Great Commandment, right, to go into the world, to share Christ, and to love the Lord and our neighbors, guys, we, we're going to blow it. And so God has given us a tremendous opportunity. If you know anything about me at all, in my journey in life, I have moved more times than I've ever wanted to. It's just how God uses me. And we are approaching a season that we've got some marching orders. And when God gives me these things, I want to share them with you, but I've got to make sure that all the ducks are in a row and all the T's are crossed and the I's are dotted. We've got some great plans coming. And those that have been with me from the beginning knows that in those nine times that we moved in ten years, this is what I learned. Everybody looking at me right now has got an opinion. You do. If I said, give me your opinion about whatever, you'd give me your opinion. Everybody's got an opinion. But every move that God has ever made with Yvette and I has always been better than the last. Not one time has God ever led us astray. If we are faithful and obedient to him, over the small things, God blesses us with bigger things. Everybody hates change. Change is good. Oh, in the twinkling of an eye, you're going to be changed. So I'm excited, and I'll share with that in the days ahead. I just wanted you to know that the, the return of Christ is so critical for us to focus on the second coming, the one who is opposed to the purposes of God is Satan. He will bound for a thousand years, right? He'll be bound by chains, released to deceive the nations, and then finally judged at the end of the age, not the end of the world, the end of the age. The Bible refers to this period of time as the second coming 
and the great white throne judgment. It will include all of creation. The great white throne judgment is an awe-inspiring and terrifying thought. You don't want to be at that throne. You want to be at the Bema Seat of Christ. The books will be open, and we will be judged based on the righteousness of God. There are no exceptions, no omissions, and no excuses. There will be no miscarriage of justice, just the awesome righteousness of God, like a giant spotlight evaluating all. All will be revealed. The book of life will also be opened at the second coming. It is the record of all who have received life eternal. Scripture says that eternal life is the gift of God through grace. It has nothing to do with us and everything to do with what God has done for us. The glory of God will be seen in the return of Christ during the end times, whether it be in judgment on the unrepentant or in the blessing on the redeemed. Do not be afraid of the book of Revelation. God wrote the book. If God wrote Genesis, then He also wrote Revelation. And so often we pick and choose what we want to go through and talk about. Do not be afraid of that. They're just theories. You know, I'm never going to lose fellowship with anybody who might be post-trib, mid-trib, or pre-trib, or pre-rap. The love of the Father in me and the love of the Father in you is far more important to maintain and establish. Amen? The doctrines, right doctrines, produce right living. And so we want to stay truthful to the Word of God in that regard. And so just the encouraging word that he was talking about there, the man of lawlessness, he's going to do what he's going to do. Um, I enjoy um, eschatology. I enjoy the study of the end things. I do. I love it. 